This is the Mold Inspection Training online video course. My name is Benjamin Gramico. I'm your course instructor. Welcome to the course. I am a certified master inspector, that's CMI. I am a certified course instructor from InterNACHI, and I'm a proud member of InterNACHI. I have been performing home inspections since 1996, and welcome to the course. The purpose of this course is to define and teach good practice for conducting a mold inspection in a building. The student will learn to find mold and report mold growth in a building using a visual examination and sampling procedures. You will learn what mold is, the IAC2 mold inspection standards of practice, health effects related to mold exposure, what molds need to grow, how to perform a visual ex examination of a building, how to perform perform mold sampling, the IEC2 mold sampling decision chart, the IEC2 mold sampling procedures, proper use of tools, PPE, personal protection equipment, hypotheses development, building science related to moisture intrusion into the house and mold growth, microbial growth, sampling devices and procedures, documentation of work, laboratory result interpretation, mold remediation, report writing, report writing, preventing mold growth. Dr. Shane, chief mycologist at ProLab, is a guest of this course, and he will demonstrate how to use all of the mold sampling devices and um, collection devices and cassettes and tapes and pumps um, on this course. This course is designed primarily for residential building inspectors. This course is a requirement for membership of the International Association of Certified Indoor Air Consultants. That's IAC2. You can find that at www.iac2.org. This course has been approved by the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors. You can find that at www.internachi.org. The EPA does not regulate mold, mold spores, mold, sa mold sampling, mold inspectors at all. There are no federal or state threshold limit values for inspectors to use when interpreting results of mold spores in, in the indoor air environment. There are no federal or state requirements for inspectors in the sampling of mold. So research of the most accepted best industry practices have been compiled in effort to develop a course for mold inspection training. This video course and the course document upon which it is based provide simple guidelines. Some professionals may prefer other inspection and sampling methods. This course doesn't cover all of those situations. It does not reference all research and information sources and it does not review all potentially useful methods, methods and procedures. The absence of a method standard or technique from this course doesn't indicate that it's not important or effective. Research on mold and on its health effects continues. This course doesn't describe all the potential health effects related to mold exposure. It only provides an overview. For more detailed information about health effects and mold exposure, consult a health professional or your state and local health department. This course categorizes two types of mold inspections. One is a complete mold inspection. The other is a limited mold inspection. So it's very easy to remember. Complete or limited. A complete mold inspection is performed by an IAC2 certified mold inspector. The complete mold inspection is performed in accordance with the mold inspection standards of practice of IAC2. In a complete mold inspection, an inspector shall perform a non-invasive examination of the readily visible, readily accessible installed systems and components of the building listed in the standards of practice. The inspector shall perform moisture, temperature, and humidity measurements, at least three air samples, two outdoor, one indoor, and possibly one surface sampling of an area of concern. In a complete mold inspection, the inspector shall report several things. 
areas of concern, which are moisture intrusion, water damage, musty odors, apparent mold growth, conditions that are conducive to mold growth. Those are the areas of concern. The inspector will also report the results of a laboratory analysis of all mold samplings taken at the building and also report any system or component that is listed in the standards of practice but were not examined for and the reasons why they were not examined. Unless the inspector and client agree to a limitation of the inspection, the inspection will be performed on the primary building and parking structure. So a complete mold inspection includes a visual examination of the entire building, its systems and components, moisture, temperature, and humidity measurements, and samplings. Now there's another type of mold inspection that you can do once you're certified. It's limited. It's a limited mold inspection. That's when you're hired not to do a complete evaluation or examination of the home, but you just go in at a certain area because there's obviously a, uh, an, a defined specific area that has a problem or a potential problem. So there's the complete one where you are examining the entire structure for moisture intrusion, the areas of concern. Or um, there's a limited uh, mold inspection where you just go in at a specific area that's been defined by you and your client. So a limited mold inspection is performed by an IAC2 certified mold inspector and the inspector shall perform a visual non-invasive visual examination of um, the systems and components of only the specific room or area defined by the inspector. At least three air, sam three air samples are performed, two outside, one inside, and likely a surface sampling because that's probably why you're being called to the property. There's something visual and they want to confirm that that is um, actual mold growth and that mold growth is putting spores into the air and it could be contaminating the rest of the building or causing health effects. In a limited mold inspection, the inspector will report areas of concern, moisture intrusion, water damage, musty odors, always use your nose, apparent mold growth, conditions conducive to mold growth, and results of any laboratory analysis of all mold samplings taken at the building. The limited mold inspection is a fast, affordable way to confirm the existence of mold and, if possible, determine the type of mold that is uh, present in that specific defined area and to confirm that the mold spores are in the air. So an example of a limited mold inspection. The inspector's client requests a limited mold inspection to be performed. The scope is specifically limited to the underfloor crawl space area. Only the crawl space will be inspected, including a non-invasive examination and at least um, one mold sampling inside the crawl space. I would do the air sample inside the crawl space and probably a surface sample because somebody probably has some concern over something that's visible or apparent. So you've got the three air samples in the limited mold inspection, two outside, one inside. I'd take a, a, an air sample inside the crawl space to see if there's an elevated level of mold spores in the crawl space and probably a, a surface sampling or two or three. No longer is there any need for a mold sample, a surface sampling only. A surface sampling only, if you go in and do just a surface sampling, that's basically useless because, um, well, you need to know if that mold growth, you, you've confirmed that that mold growth is actually mold, let's say, with a, um, a tape sampling and a laboratory analysis. But you want to know if the spores from that growth are in the air and if it's elevated. Let's go over the IAC2 
mold inspection, standards of practice. The scope. The purpose of this standard is to provide standardized procedures to be used for a mold inspection. And we've gone over the two types of mold inspections, complete and limited. Unless the inspector and client agree to a limitation of the inspection, the inspection will be performed at the primary building and attached parking structure. Detached parking structures shall be inspected separately. So if you have a detached garage with a residential home, you can't combine mold samples, air samples, with the detached garage and the interior of the home. The outdoor samples will be used as comparison with the indoor samples to see if there is an elevation of concentration of mold spores indoor or outdoor. So you have to take in consideration that the detached structure, say it's a detached garage, is a separate inspection. You have to set your client's expectations as well. They may have concerns about mold growth inside the home as well as at the detached garage and you have to explain that those are two separate structures and we need to treat them separately. The standards of practice states that a mold inspection is valid for the date of the inspection and cannot predict future mold growth. Because conditions conducive to mold growth in a building can vary greatly over time, the results of a mold inspection examination and sampling can only be relied upon for the point in time at which the inspection was conducted. And that's a bit of a, a weakness and criticism of a mold sampling, especially air samples. It's only a moment in time that you are able to record. A mold inspection is not a home or property inspection. Try not to combine the two if you're doing a residential home inspection and a mold inspection. Make sure that they are separate, almost conducted separately. Although the best type of mold inspector is a home inspector. And we'll get into that later, the reasons why. It's because of the experience with building signs that mold, uh, home inspectors have. A mold inspection is not a comprehensive indoor air quality inspection either. And a mold inspection is not intended to eliminate the uncertainty or the risk of the presence of mold or the adverse effects that mold may cause in a building or its components. It's not a guarantee, a warranty, or insurance policy. I simply state in my report that mold grows. Can't predict it. You are required to inspect certain things and you are not required to inspect other things. You're required to inspect the roof. The inspector shall inspect from the ground level or the eaves. You do not have to get up on the roof. The inspector shall inspect from the ground level or the eaves the roof covering. That's important. A deteriorated roof in very poor condition with missing shingle pieces or damaged areas is a condition conducive to mold growth and that is one of the things that an inspector shall report upon. So inspect the roof and then report the condition. The inspector shall inspect from the ground level or eaves the roof drainage system including gutters and downspouts. A clogged gutter is a condition that's conducive to mold growth. The vents, flashing, skylights, chimneys, and any other type of roof penetrations, penetrations coming through where moisture is the big concern with mold inspections. And any type of penetration coming through the roof covering has to be inspected as closely as possible. I like to carry a bunch of ladders, tall ones, and to get up on the roof, to get real close, face to face, so to speak. You don't have to, it's not required. But ideally, you'd be able to identify any type of flashing area that is improperly installed or has a problem on top of the roof. You're not required to walk on any roof surface. You're not required to predict the service life expectancy. You're not required to perform any water test either. Exterior and grounds. It's very important to inspect the exterior perimeter around the house, the ground areas. We don't want water 
directed towards the house. Again, the concern is water. The house is not a watertight structure, actually, in many areas. The roof covering is not designed to be waterproof or watertight, water resistant. So we're looking for water, and you have to imagine inspecting. I start with the roof because that's how water moves. It starts with the roof and it moves down into the gutter drainage system, sometimes down the siding, and then we have to uh, be concerned with the exterior grade perimeter. We want ideally a nice slope away from the house. The inspector shall inspect from ground level the cladding, flashing, trim, siding, covering, exterior doors, windows, decks, stoops, steps, stairs, porches, railings, eaves, soffits, fascias, everything. An open gap is a condition that's conducive to mold growth. It could allow moisture penetration. The exterior grading surrounding the perimeter is very important and items that penetrate the exterior siding covering, say um, the exhaust pipes of a uh, high efficiency gas furnace. You're not required to inspect underground drainage systems, window well, um, window well drainage systems, if there are any. Um, and you're not required to inspect anything that is not related to moisture or the mold inspection. It's not a home inspection. Your client should understand this is not a home inspection. You're not performing a home inspection. So there are many things that a home inspector looks at, but a mold inspector doesn't need to. Ground faults, exterior ground faults. You don't need to check that. Basement, foundation, crawl space, and structure. A mold inspection requires the inspector to inspect the foundation, basement, or crawl space, general structure, including ventilation. The inspector should also inspect for areas of concern, including moisture intrusion especially in the crawl space. You're not required to operate sump pumps with inaccessible floats or sealed containers. Sometimes a radon system will require that the sump pump lid be sealed down. You don't need to cut that open. You are not required to inspect for structural defects not related to mold growth or moisture intrusion. Say um, a cut cord of a truss inside an attic space. I would report it, but it's not required. The inspector shall inspect the air handler, circulating fan, the air filter, the condensate pump, readily visible ductwork. Don't have to go inside the ductwork, especially if it's underground. Sometimes, if it, I know it's underground, I'll take the uh, supply register off the floor and drop my camera, digital camera, down inside and take a picture. And you can see sometimes there's a lot of rust in those round ducts because they're underground and they haven't been installed properly. Probably just dropped right into um, a dirt ditch. You are to inspect representative number of supply and return air registers. If there's an HVAC system inside the building, it's essential that that HVAC system be sampled or inspected and inspected. Don't have to look for and inspect every return and supply register. It's impossible, really, especially if the house is occupied with a bunch of furniture. Representative number, which means one in every room. The central humidifier. Humidifiers are conducive to mold growth. Um, as soon as something gets wet in there, Mold can grow. That's it. The central air conditioning unit, especially the coils, if you can pull off the front cover, say, at that coil, look at the coil frame, see the fins, the pan, condensate pan, follow the drainage. It's really important. Mold growth, I found mold growth on those coils because of uh, delayed maintenance at the HVAC system and a del um, delayed maintenance at the heating, ventilating, air conditioning system um, is a condition conducive to mold growth. We'll put that in the report. You're not required to inspect the coil if it's not readily accessible. Sometimes they're not, or 
it's just restricted in some way. And if you can't get to the condensate pan either, you don't have to inspect that. You don't have to test the efficiency or performance of the HVAC system. And you're not required to inspect the interior of the ductwork. But as you'll learn later, there's a lot of stuff going on on the inside. Plumbing. The inspector shall inspect the readily visible main water line, including the main water shutoff valve, meter, sometimes those are dripping. Uh, anything dripping water is a condition conducive to mold growth. The readily visible water supply lines, hot and cold water lines, sometimes cold water lines, excuse me, sometimes cold water lines will um, drip condensate. The readily visible drain waste vent pipes. Hot water source, hot water source, old hot water tanks could be dripping, leaking. If they're in a closet somewhere or in a, in a corner, oftentimes I'll find mold growth or apparent mold growth in the corner of the, the building materials where that maybe discharge pipe, the TPR valve, is dripping. And all of the fixtures in the house. And we're looking, we're concerned about moisture, so we're looking at all of the fixtures, anything that has water supply to it. You have to turn it on and see if it leaks. Toilets, faucets, showers, tubs. You're not required to test the showers and tubs by filling them with water, not a water test. You're not required to test whirlpool tubs, saunas, steam rooms, steam rooms even though it introduces an, an amazing amount of humidity into the interior air. You're not required to um, fire them up or hot tubs. You're not required to inspect plumbing defects that are not related to mold growth or moisture intrusion. Say something um, isn't sloped, um, a drain line isn't sloped properly. It's not really a condition conducive to mold growth, it's really a plumbing problem. Attic, ventilation, and insulation. The inspector shall inspect the insulation. Insulation is very important for that perimeter exterior wall and ceiling, that barrier, that insulation barrier, to keep the warm, moist air, say, of the inside of the home separated from the cold, dry outside air. You shall inspect the ventilation of attic spaces. Attic spaces seem to have a lot of problems with um, moisture intrusion, there's moisture and condensation, and lack of ventilation. So it's really important to get up in there. If you can get through the scuttle or attic access, that's ideal. Get a face mask, protect yourself, don't breathe in that stuff, and uh, get up in there and take a look around if you can. Be safe. And um, take a look at the framing and sheathing. Sometimes roof leaks will leave marks, leave a history of the performance of the roof, and you want to look for water damage and moisture intrusion. You're not required to move, touch, or disturb insulation. You're not required to inspect for vapor retarders if it's underneath the insulation. You don't need to break or otherwise damage the surface finish of or the weather seal of the um, access panel or scuttle hatch to get into the attic space. Interior. There's a lot of things to inspect in the interior, but we're really, really looking for apparent signs of mold growth, water intrusion, maybe water damage. So look at the walls, ceilings, and floors, really for indications of moisture problems or moisture intrusion or roof leaks or plumbing problems. Check the ventilation of the kitchen, bathrooms, and laundry. Those three areas can introduce 
a lot of moisture and humidity into the home. Whole house ventilation fans, turn those on. The inspector is not required to inspect interior defects not related to moisture intrusion or mold growth, say a representative number of switches, lights, receptacles. Moisture, humidity, and temperature. Three things that an inspector can inspect during a mold inspection. Moisture is something that an inspector shall inspect. The other two, hem uh, humidity and temperature, it's at your discretion. You don't have to. It's not required. But an inspector shall measure moisture of any room or area of the building that has an area of concern. Moisture intrusion, water damage, moldy odors. If you smell something moldy in a room, use your moisture meter. You shall inspect for you shall measure moisture in that room. Um, apparent mold growth, conditions conducive to mold growth. If you have those areas of concern, you shall measure moisture. You shall use your moisture meter. Probe the carpeting on the floor, something on the wall, something on the ceiling. Take a look around. See if you can find something because those things, those five things, indicate moisture and um, apparent mold growth. If you especially see apparent mold growth, then there's an indication of moisture problems. Sampling. The IAC2 mold inspection sampling procedures. We have Dr. Shane as a guest in the course, and he will be demonstrating how to perform samplings or um, how to actually use the sampling devices. Um, the cassettes, tapes, um, and um, the pump, air pump. So um, that'll be later on. But right now we'll go over the general idea of the sampling procedures. And this is on the website at www.iac2.org. There is a IAC2 mold sampling decision chart. It's a little chart that you can use um, and try to memorize that helps you decide what sampling devices to use in relation to what you see, observe, or measure. And that chart is available. It's inside the sampling procedures and it's on the website, IAC2 website. And it's very easy to use. As you walk around, if you're holding something, you can keep that chart available as a reference, as a guide. So use the IAC2 mold sampling decision chart and use the standards of practice to help you um, decide where and when to take samplings. Samples of the indoor air and the outside air should be taken for comparison. There should not be any mold inside the house that is not found outside. The concentration of mold inside a home should not be higher than the concentration of mold outside. Keep in mind that mold spores in the air being sampled can vary greatly in relation to the life cycle of mold, atmospheric and environmental conditions, and the amount of ventilation. There are seasonal and diurnal variability in airborne mold at an indoor residential environment. Air sampling may be necessary if the presence of mold is suspected, for example, musty odors, but cannot be identified by visual examination. The purpose of such sampling is to determine the location and or extent of the mold contamination. All mold spores have a source and identifying the source is really the goal. Because the outdoor sample is the control and is used to compare with the indoor sample, the samples should be collected as close as possible in time to each other and under similar conditions. Air samples should be collected at the same airflow rate for the same duration of time, near the same height above the floor or ground level in all rooms that are sampled indoors, and using the same type of collection device. Airflow rate. There are many different types of air pumps, measurement meters, and spore collectors that can be used for an air sample in a mold inspection. The air pump should be adjusted 
to collect air at a flow rate that is recommended by the manufacturer of the collection device. The result of an air pump sample is recorded in spores per, per meter cubed. If the air flow rate is too fast, the mold spores that come into the collector will either um, just simply bypass the plate, the slide, or it will literally bounce off and not stick. So if you have your pump, if your pump is not calibrated properly and it's pumping too fast, then let's see, you've got your collector and you've got your plate with the uh, little agar material and mold spores are coming in. If they're coming in too fast, they'll just zoop right by it. Or they will um, actually hit and bounce and go right by. Ideally, you want the mold spore to stick, to come in at a nice rate and to hit. Um, there's been a lot of studies and research on this. Mold spores actually come in, hit, and then they'll bounce and then they'll collect just at the edge of that material, agar material. So when you look at a slide, you actually see a lot of mold spores collecting on the outer edge of this slide here. So airflow rate is really important when you're taking air samples. Rotometers are used to measure the airflow. Airflow meters provide field accuracy in an easy to read instrument as a rotometer. The principle of operation is simple. Airflow passes through a vertical tapered tube that pushes a small ball up. And as the air passes through, as a little ball rises, the clearance between the ball and the tube will increase. The ball becomes stationary when the diameter of the tube is large enough to allow the total airflow past the ball. And then the airflow rate is determined by reading the number on the tube that is in the middle position of that stabilized ball. So on an air pump, you have this little rotometer. It's a tube, somewhat tapered. There's a ball here. And air is coming up. This is the airflow coming up through, and it pushes on this ball, and it will push on this ball to a certain point when there's the total amount of airflow going around that ball. And where that ball is, there'll be a number here. And sometimes it's 15, or depending on the manufacturer's recommendations. Surface sampling. Surface sampling can provide information regarding whether the visible apparent mold is in fact actual microbial growth or mold or not. Measure, they can measure the relative degree of mold contamination and the surface sampling can serve to confirm that the mold sampled may be producing mold spores in the air. Now, during an inspection, if you have an area of concern you should take one sample, at least one sample. If there's an area of concern in a room or area with moisture intrusion, water damage, musty odors, apparent mold growth, conditions conducive to mold growth, the inspector shall perform at least one surface sample in each of those areas of concern. So if you have two bedrooms, they, both, they each have apparent mold growth. You have to take a surface sample in each one. Additional surface samples may be performed at the discretion of the inspector. Now let's say you have no areas of concern. Then it's not required. If you don't have any areas of concern, a surface sampling is not required. If you don't have any moisture intrusion, if you don't have any water damage, musty odors, things like that, you don't have to take a surface sampling. You're not sure, not sure where you would take one if you don't have those areas of concern you are required to take an air sample. For a swab sample, an inspector shall take at least one swab sample when a visual examination of the building yields 
moisture intrusion, water damage, apparent mold growth, musty odors, or conditions conducive to mold growth. Additional sampling may be performed at the discretion of the inspector. The swab comes in a plastic container. Um, there are things that you shouldn't really touch, and I'm going to touch it just so we can talk about it. The tip. Looks like a Q-tip. The cellulose swab is moistened with a liquid preservative stored in an ampoule at the end of the tube container. Any bacteria collected with the swab are transferred via the swab into the tube. The tube is then sent directly to the laboratory, just like this. And there's places to record your area's date and time and address of the property. A swab provides immediate determination of the presence of fungal spores as well as what types of fungi are present. So this is a very easy, very easy to use, and um, I've used them all the time. For a swab sample, each swab has a unique identification number. Write the number on the tube itself and on the chain of custody document. Each room, take a sample in each room or area where there is an area of concern, especially apparent mold. Each color, if there's apparent mold growth with different colors in the room or area, take a sample of each colored mold. Different colors may indicate different mold types. substrate. If mold is visible on different substrates or building materials such as wood, drywall, wallpaper, then a sample from each different material is recommended. Let's go to tape samplings. A tape system provides a quick way to sample visible mold. A tape lift system is the most common surface sampling technique, I believe. It can be used instead of a swab sample, excuse me, so here's a tape, comes in its own little package. This is a, a bio tape. Many samples can be collected in a short period of time. It's very easy to do. And the samples that show fragments, mold fragments, and reproductive structures, spores, can provide proof of mold growth. Each of these tapes need to be identified. Each tape should have a unique identification number. This is for the chain of custody. It's for you and especially for the laboratory to keep everything in order. Each room, take the sample in each room or area where the area of concern is located, especially if there is apparent visible mold growth. So again, if you have two rooms with um, moisture intrusion and another room with some type of condition conducive to mold growth, let's say the window AC unit has caused water damage and there's stains there. Um, take a sample in each room, not just one in one building, one in each area of concern, and each color. If there are different colors of the apparent mold growth, take a tape sample of each color, and mold can be of many different colors. And each substrate. If m this apparent mold growth is located on different substrates, like drywall or wood or wallpaper, take a tape sample on the different substrates or building materials because some molds grow better on different building materials. A carpet. A carpet tends to contain a history of any mold that has been growing in the building. The carpet sampling is performed to reveal previous mold problems that may have been covered up or cleaned up. A carpet sampling can also reveal undetected mold growth Choose an area that is not heavily walked upon, an area with little traffic. The best area actually has been determined to be in front of a sofa and alongside a bed. And so refer to the mold sampling decision chart and mold sampling procedures for more details. A household vacuum machine is used, and this cartridge right here. You stick the 
this um, cartridge on the end of the vacuum hose with an adapter that usually comes with the, the sampling device. There's a filter inside. It collects all of the dirt and the hair and the stuff, allergens, things that cause allergens, including mold spores, inside, and you send it to the laboratory, and they analyze it, and you get the results. If a carpet has not been cleaned thoroughly prior to a sampling, no big deal. A carpet can easily hold evidence of a mold problem that happened way in the past in the house. Even after cleaning, there could be mold sp uh, spores discovered deep in the carpet. So it's good to get that deep inside the pile.